first fire drill. Everybody comes in and really fantastic. <laughs> okay, are we good to go? Yeah, are we good to go? Yeah, you want to pin her on the... Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay, and that's just a right-click yeah. pin for me. Excellent. Hide the people thing here now too, I think. Perfect. How's that? I think that looks great. Okay. Good. Well, Margaret, I think we're going to start now. We're kind of um, constrained by our online audience. Are we good to go from online? All right. Good. Well, I want to welcome all of you in person. I know that uh, as Baptists, we would tend to have like at least a song or two before we get back everybody in the house, but uh, we're also... Um, hosting an online audience today, and, and they will likely be already tuned in here and tuning in as we speak. So a welcome to all of you in person. I recognize many of your faces, but I know that we have some different friends and people from the neighborhood who are here, so a special welcome to you. And I know that watching online, we have who knows how many people from uh, churches scattered around Western Canada here with the Canadian Baptists of Western Canada, uh, or people who just heard about it through those friends. Uh, so thank you to all of you for taking some time out this uh, beautiful Saturday morning to be educated and equipped about this important topic of medical assistance and dying. Um, I can imagine that your reasons for being here are quite diverse and perhaps even overlapping. Uh, for example, I would guess that some of us might be thinking about end-of-life issues for ourselves, either because of age or health circumstances. Uh, some of us are in caregiving roles for family members or others, or we can at least foresee ourselves being in a caregiving role sometime here in the future. Some of us, we like to watch the news, and we are concerned about the state of euthanasia here in Canada. Um, and uh, for those of you who are uh, Christians, you don't have to be a Christian, of course, to be a part of our gathering here today. But if you have religious convictions about these things, uh, you might kind of wonder how to integrate your Christian faith with this topic and, and how to think it all through. And I'm sure there are many other reasons, too. Uh, but whatever your reasons are for being here, I am glad that you are here. If you don't know me, I'm one of our pastors here. I'm the lead pastor at Trinity Baptist, and my name is Jeff Gulliher. Before I introduce our guest speaker today, I thought I would give us all a little orientation for the morning. We are going to begin with a one-hour presentation by our speaker, and the focus on this first hour is to educate us on the issue of medical assistance in dying or euthanasia. So again, it's about education, as it were. There are no PowerPoint slides or formal handouts for our presentation this morning, but you are encouraged to take notes. And you'll probably see just some pieces of paper there on your table uh, that might be labeled as sermon notes. Um, you can definitely use those to take notes. And if you need more, we have plenty more at the kind of the round table near the back there, and you can get up at any time and grab more paper if you need it. Um, and there's actually also, I'll mention it now, I'll probably mention it again, uh, Dr. Margaret Cottle has co-authored a few articles uh, from 2018 and 2020 that have also put at those tables there as well. For those of you who are watching here in person today, there's a little bit of a perk for you. You are the only ones who are going to be able to participate in our question and answer time a little later. Now, I want to make note, though, we won't be taking questions from the floor where people will be speaking, because uh, that tends to be a little easier for people who are more comfortable in, with public speaking. Instead, there are these blank recipe cards that are on your table as well, and I would encourage you at any time during our uh, presentations this morning to um, write those questions down, preferably one question per card, and then drop your cards in this green box here up at the front. Um, and I will read them uh, to Dr. Cottle a little bit later. It might be easiest to drop these off during our break time. And I'm, I'll admit, I'm pretty sure I won't be able to get to every question, so please allow me the right to be selective in choosing which questions we will pose uh, to Dr. Cottle. So after our first hour of presentation, we will take a 10-minute break. And if you're here in person, we will have snacks and coffee here prepared by our lovely volunteers and washrooms. If you're unaware, they're just through that uh, hallway there. Uh, when we reconvene after our break, though, our guest speaker will lead us through a shorter presentation. And the emphasis here will be more practical, not so much on education, but more about equipping, equipping us with thoughts 
uh, on what we can do within our own sphere of family and friends. And then lastly, as I've already hinted at, we will finish off our time with a question and answer time. So be sure to write your questions down before then. All right, so that's our orientation for this morning. Let's turn our attention now to our guest speaker. Dr. Margaret Cottle is graciously joining us online from Vancouver, BC this morning where it is only 9 a.m. Um, I, when I studied at Regent College back in the day in Vancouver in the early 2010s, I had the privilege of hearing Dr. Cottle give guest lectures. And about a year or two ago, uh, a few of us here from Trinity watched one of her online presentations about MAID. And we thought it would be excellent to have her present to our church. And here we are. Now, here's a little bit more about Dr. Margaret Cottle, if you don't know her. Um, she is a palliative care physician in Greater Vancouver, BC, working in home hospice programs. She is also, besides that, a clinical assistant professor at the University of British Columbia in the Division of Palliative Care in the Faculty of Medicine. Dr. Cottle speaks internationally about end-of-life issues and palliative care, and she actually addressed members of the Canadian Parliament both in 20, or 2006 and 2017. She completed her training in dignity therapy in 2012, and she has a special interest and expertise in dignity-conserving care. Dr. Cottle and her husband are busy. Uh, he is an ophthalmologist, and uh, together they have sponsored the local student chapter of the Christian Medical and Dental Association of Canada for the past 30 years, which means that they have been inviting students into their home for weekly meals and studies together, among other things that they do with that. Um, I just found out here today that uh, Dr. Margaret Cottle and I have a thing in common. We both have black Labrador Retriever dogs. <laughs> but hers actually has a job because her dog often accompanies her uh, and also her husband both in their clinical work. But I hear, I think it's correct that you also have a new puppy in your house too. Which, uh, yeah. You may hear her too. <laughs> yeah. she, she's in another room right now, but she's not very happy about being in her crate. She's only 11 <laughs> weeks old. So. Okay. Uh, the Coddles have two grown children, and with their lovely spouses, they have blessed them with five wonderful grandchildren. Uh, besides her medical work, Dr. Coddle is a calligrapher and a watercolor artist, and she hosts a membership called Grand Connections to help grandparents uh, form deeper connections with their grandchildren. And you can see her work on these things at her website, welcomeandwonder.com. That's welcomeandwonder.com. She also has an Instagram uh, account. The handle there is at mmcdesigns.studio. mmcdesigns.studio. So that's a little bit of an orientation to who will be um, giving us a lovely presentation today. So Dr. Cottle, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's give her a warm Trinity welcome. Thank you very much. So, um, let's just open it a word of prayer. Maybe Pastor Jeff, you would you'd be kind enough to do that for us. I'd be happy to. Jesus, we uh, welcome ourselves into your new day, a gift of another day that you've given to each of us. We thank you for the gift of life. We know that it's precious. We know that it is sacred. And we want to be good stewards of the lives that we have and of the lives of the people around us that you love and that we love. We come to you today in a posture of humility, wanting to learn and wanting to have the courage to be able to work through uh, what we learn. And so we open ourselves up to you and to what will be said and done and thought about here today. Uh, by your Holy Spirit, equip us all. We pray that you would speak through Dr. Cottle as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, so I used to do presentations, to do presentations on, this on this topic. I've been working in palliative care for about 30, about 30 years. And, and I used to... Now, now somehow, somehow we, need we need to deal with this because I'm hearing the... the my voice, my voice a little bit, a little bit later, later echoing. echoing. Can we, Can we is there a way to deal with that, that Dave? So that, so that when I talk, I don't hear myself a little bit later. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try muting my mic. Yeah. There we go. Good. Okay, let's try okay, that. Let's try that. <laughs> Sorry. 
I'm, I'm old enough, enough that I can't multitask as well as I once did. And so when I hear myself voice, it's kind of, oh, where do we go? So I used to do these presentations. That's much better. Thank you. I used to do these presentations, and I would have lots of slides with lots of information. And I felt like people were able to get the information, but it didn't really sink in. It wasn't um, personal to them. So I got invited to talk about this issue with a high school class and their senior law studies. And I decided, I just had this inspiration, I think, from the Lord to make it much more interactive. And it was so much better that when I was asked to speak at Willingdon Church with a large group of people, I decided I was going to try it there too. And it's become the my go-to way of discussing this issue. So the reason that I'm doing this is I want everybody to be thinking about the questions that I'm asking. Now, the, the questions, because we're in this format, will have to be more rhetorical. But I, I don't want you to be left off the hook because of that. Um, when I talked to the high school students, I said, I want it to be a bit like theater sports, where somebody says something and then the next person has to jump in when you get pointed at. So when I ask a question, even though I'm gonna be answering it, um, I want you to be thinking about what your answer might be and what you think someone might be thinking, just so that it, it pulls us in to understand where we're going in the right direction and our thinking and where we might need to make a course adjustment. So um, the first thing that I ask students at, um, at, at the high school or in any presentation is, first of all, do you know what it is? Do you know what MAID is? And it's medical aid in dying um, is the acronym for it. Now, for, for those of us in palliative care, we're a little bit disgusted that that's the term that's being used. Many of us who are opposed to euthanasia say we've been giving medical aid in dying for decades and we've never killed anyone. So the, this idea that somehow the language has been co-opted to make it sound like it's just a, another medical treatment and not the ending of a life, not a killing, not the taking of a life is a little bit um, a little bit concerning and upsetting. And just to show you how how the language has been co-opted in this in this discussion, when we had as the Christian Medical and Dental Association, um, we we wanted to have a seminar about the psychological effects of euthanasia, and they would not give us continuing medical education credit for it unless we said the psychological effects of MAID because they don't want anything in there about assisted suicide or euthanasia or medical termination or any of those any of those other terms that are actually more honest. So we're we're fighting an uphill battle right from the start in terms of what the language is. So there is um, a sort of a technical difference in what would be called euthanasia and what would be assisted suicide. Now, it all really falls under the banner of a suicide, of assisted suicide. It's someone who is choosing to die before the end of a natural life. And anyone who is supporting this um, euthanasia contests this. They say the person doesn't really want to die. They just don't want to live like they're living. Well, <clears throat> to me, that's splitting hairs. If you're asking someone to help you die, then that is a form of suicide. And they they have done all sorts of studies and showed that when, well, when you call it anything that has assisted suicide in it, then people don't want to do it. Well, okay, <laughs> maybe because you're telling the truth. But um, anyway, that is there, there is a technical difference in some circles when you will hear about it where they will say assisted suicide would be prescribing the pills. It's when the person himself or herself has some agency in, in what happens. So taking pills, starting a machine, um, 
There's all kinds of really macabre things that are out there for ways for people to to um, uh, make themselves die, to to kill themselves. Um, and and um, euthanasia is usually more associated with a lethal injection. Now, here in Canada, we have the capability to do both with our law. But to be honest, we only have a 99.9% .9 of the of the medical terminations that happen in Canada are done by lethal injection. When a doctor or a nurse practitioner gives uh, a series of uh, injections in order to um, to uh, kill the patient, um, I, I was telling Pastor Jeff yesterday that I before this was legal, I had said to a colleague of mine, well, who was in favor of it. Well, I'm not sure that very many doctors are going to feel like killing their patients. And he said, whoa, be careful. That's very inflammatory language. And I said, well, okay, you know, I want to play nice in the sandbox here and have a dialogue. What should I have said? And he said, well, you could say take the life instead of kill. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that, that we're looking at and the, the sort of um, uh, obfuscation of the of the truth of what's going on that's out there. So in Canada, the the highest percentage, uh, the overwhelming percentage is the lethal injection. And part of the reason for that, it's rather interesting in countries where they have and jurisdictions like states in the United States, where they only have assisted suicide where the patient has to have some agency, take the pills, do whatever. The, the suicide rate, the assisted suicide rate has stayed relatively low. In Oregon, for example, they've had uh, the pills uh, prescribed for over 25 years now, and their suicide, their assisted suicide rate has gone up from 0 0.2 and 0.3 percent to um, 0 0.8 or 9, so still less than 1% of all deaths. In Canada, we've only had it legalized since 2016. And um, last year, we had the last year that we have statistics and kind of looking at it, it looks like it was about 14,000 deaths. And on Vancouver Island, a colleague of mine told me that they are up to almost 10% of all deaths. So one in 10 people who are dying on Vancouver Island are dying because a doctor or a nurse practitioner gives them a lethal injection. And if you remember when this was brought in and argued at the Supreme Court, the argument was, oh, it's only gonna be for these really tough cases. Now it's become very normalized. <clears throat> so. That's just a laying the groundwork for what we're actually talking about here in Canada. So the next question for you is, why do you think people would want to have this? Just take a moment and think, you know, why would somebody want to have this? Why would they want to have a nurse practitioner or a doctor come to their hospital room, come to their home, uh, come to their nursing home and give them a lethal injection? Why would they want to do that? Well, the, the first answer that usually comes up is because of pain. People say, well, uh, it's because the person's in terrible pain. Do you know that this is way down the list for why people actually um, have access to take, get access to this? And in fact, in Oregon, when they first put this law out, in order to have pain even register, on their uh, on the reasons why people were requesting this, they had to say pain or fear of <clears throat> or fear of future pain, and then it came up to about twenty percent of people were saying it. So, the main reasons are not pain. The main reasons are um, a loss of being. Uh, it's actually their the main reasons are all related to disability. They're related to the, uh, an acquired disability due to an illness or um, 
a condition at the, at the end of life, or they're related to a disability that the person has had lifelong. And it, it should be a little chilling to us to realize that in the Supreme Court decision, they said that, that all the person had to have was a grievous and irremediable illness, condition, or disability. So the fact that you had an, an, uh, an irremediable, that means untreatable, unfixable disability was enough for you to qualify, okay? So this automatically puts our, our fellow citizens with, who are living with disabilities in a totally different category in terms of whether the government is willing to take their life. So, and on top of that, it, it had it could be grievous and irremediable condition or disability that was um, was causing intolerable suffering. But the intolerable suffering was only um, able to be determined whether it was intolerable or not by the patient. No one else had any input to that and was not amenable to a treatment that was acceptable to the patient. So can you see how subjective all of this is? So if you were diagnosed, for example, with diabetes, that's a grievous and irremediable condition. And let's say you felt like you were having intolerable suffering and you, you did not want to take insulin. So technically that's something that would qualify. So there's, there's, you, can, you can go down the list. One of my colleagues said that he was going bald and that it was going to cause, there was nothing that could happen to help that, and it was going to cause um, um, a, a intolerable suffering for him, and he didn't want a hair transplant, he didn't want to use any of these medications, he didn't want to do that, and so why, why shouldn't he qualify? So, you know, that's kind of a ridiculous example, but it shows just how, um, it shows just how subjective the whole thing is. So when you start looking at the reasons, and you can look online, I think in one of those articles, we have some of the things, but you can look online for the government of Canada. The reasons that, we are, we, that people are asking for this have to do more with not being able to, to do the things that they once enjoyed doing, um, having a disability in terms of being able to um, take care of their own bodily functions with um, also not being able to uh, to uh, care for the people around them, feeling like another big one is feeling like they're a burden on their families. So all of these things rank way above any kind of symptoms. And interestingly, what has been ha what happened at the beginning was we were told, oh, this was only going to happen for these really tough cases. And I, I remember talking to a colleague of mine, <clears throat> sorry, who um, who said, um, I said, well, what if the person is really just having a problem because they're poor or they're homeless or other issues like that? And he said, well, you know, that, that if that's the reason, the person would never qualify. Well, a few months into it, or a few, uh, at least very quickly into um, this being legalized, and I tend to call it medical termination, which is the name that the Dutch people use, and they're just more honest than we are uh, about, you know, not not giving the the these kind of flowery words, which mean that we're going to take your life. So um, anyway, they said they started saying people who were the maid provider started saying, oh, well, you know, our job is not to fix the social ills and fix the system. Our job is only to look and to see whether or not this person qualifies. And if this person qualifies, it doesn't matter what the social determinants of health are saying. It, it just matters whether they qualify. Well, you probably well know from seeing folks who are living maybe in on in your downtown core or dealing with addictions that almost everybody who is who has difficulty with the social determinants of health 
usually has some kind of a health issue. So there were, it was easy to find little reasons that were not the main reason that the person wanted to have it, but were there enough to help them to qualify. So lately, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> lately, the people who are proponents of this, <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> one of the joys of getting older, <laughs> having to clear my throat more often. <clears throat> anyway, one of the, where it's gone from now is now that these folks are saying, well, you people, you Dr. Cottle and other doctors who think that this is a bad idea, you're the ones who are being paternalistic. You're the ones who are denying the rights of people. If somebody, you're the ones who are not being compassionate. If somebody wants to die because they're homeless, if somebody wants to die because they're in poverty or they have an addiction that they can't seem to get over, who are you to tell them that that's not a good enough reason? If somebody has a mental health condition and it doesn't seem to be getting better, who are you to tell them that that's not a good enough reason? So we've gone from this the being sold in the media that it was just this this these really tough cases um, where somebody might Gloria Taylor for example she wanted to have somebody take her life but she didn't want to do it when she still had she had uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis ALS or Lou Gehrig's and she didn't want to have to to she wanted to be able to live until she was no longer physically able to do it so so the Supreme Court. I kid you not, the Supreme Court said that because the state, the government, would not kill her, they had um, denied her right to life. So this law came in because of Gloria Taylor's right to life. I'm not making this up. So they said if she wants to live until this point, but she would have to kill herself at this point, in order to make it happen because she doesn't want to live when she's like this. The government, if they refuse to kill her at this point, has robbed her of this much of her life and they have uh, impinged on her right to life. So <clears throat> our law that came in through the, that Supreme Court decision came in because of an appeal to the right to life. I'm just gonna mute myself for a minute and <laughs> and really cough here. So sorry, okay. <laughs> so thank you for bearing with me. All right, so this is how twisted all of this is. And um, this idea that somehow we've got this law now, because Gloria Taylor's right to life was being um, infringed upon if the government wouldn't kill her when she couldn't do it herself. So when, when you start to look at why people want this, they want it because of uh, all these, uh, these other reasons that have very little to do with pain. They have, uh, and sometimes people are wanting this when they're within hours or days of, um, of their of their natural death, simply because they the 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 biggest overall umbrella that we see for this is a lack of control. Here in Western culture, we have an illusion that we are in control. We want to be in control, but it's an illusion. You ask anybody living in sub-Sahara Africa or in the Ukraine at the moment or um, on the downtown east side here in Vancouver, whether there's, um, or someone who's in the middle of a, a tremendous snowstorm, for example, how much control you really have. And we have this illusion that we can somehow be in control. And so there's this idea that if I get the lethal injection, somehow I get death before death gets me. I'm in control. Um, it's it's the Frank Sinatra. I did it my way, um, which, ladies and gentlemen, is not a Christian virtue. Okay, 
that that is sort of uh, that's what the serpent was singing in the garden. <laughs> I did it my way. You know, did God really say? Um, and so one of the things that I'd like us to think about this morning is to come to the place where we understand. Now, if you're watching this or you're listening to this and you you don't have a belief in a creator, you don't you don't have to be a Christian to have a belief in a creator. But if if you're I'm speaking to the the Western Baptist here, and I'm speaking to my my people, the uh, fellow Christians, and I'm trying to help us um, figure out how to uh, live in this world that is very different from um, what what the Bible is talking about. So we need to come to the place where we understand that. If we do things that God says are wrong, or if we do not do things that God encourages us and and, um, commands us to do, that we are never going to experience shalom. So shalom is this beautiful word that means peace, but it means everything as it should be. It's peace with order. It's bigger than just, oh, there's no conflict. It's this sense of, Uh, all's right with things, even in the midst of a storm, even in the midst of tragedy, that sense of shalom. And if we, it doesn't matter how convenient something is, it doesn't matter how wonderful our culture thinks it is, it doesn't matter how much um, sort of shame we can hide if we do something. Um, If God says don't do it, and we do it, and God says, do it, and we don't do it, we're not going to have shalom in our own personal life. We're not going to have shalom in the life of our family, our community, our country, and our world. So we we are the image bearers of God. And we, as we bear his image, and he says that, uh, that we, each of us, that's we're, we're created in his image and we bear his image. So we need to think very carefully about whether we're being led astray by our culture, whether we're, we're like the cucumbers in the brine, that we're being changed permanently. Um, we're like the idea of being baptized. Baptizo, is, that was a, a, a word that was used for dyeing cloth. So when the cloth went in and it came out, it was never the same color again. And that's, that's a wonderful thing <laughs> in baptism. But if we, are, if we are immersed in our culture in that way, it's, it's very, we, we have to actively work on having um, God's perspective, having a bib- biblical perspective on what's going on in our world. Okay, so that's, that's for Christians. Um, the other thing is, uh, if, if we're thinking about this, we'll say, well, what's the argument that most people will give when they'll say, well, it should be legal. What's the argument that they give? Well, what the argument is, is that it's, it's an autonomous decision that I get to do what I want to do. And as long as it's not having an impact on you, you shouldn't care. You need to, um, uh, as as they, uh, you know, get stop stuffing your your faith down my throat. Now it's interesting, or your religion. It's interesting. I used to say when I would give these talks that there are no the the the, the gold standard for. Um, a medical procedure being approved is to have a peer reviewed, which means that other doctors that are know what they're talking about look at it, double blind controlled study. So you have you have it so that the researchers don't know who's who's getting the procedure and who's not or who's getting the drug and who's not. And and you've got these controlled, it's double blinded, the, the researchers don't know it, the patients don't know it all of this. Okay. So I used to say that we do not have any peer-reviewed 
double blind controlled study evidence that a person is better off dead. So if you're gonna bring this thing in, you ought to at least be able to show me that, that there's no harm. And when I would say that, I got the, all these comments about, um, get your religion, stop stuffing your religion down my throat. And I thought, this is very odd. I didn't say anything religious. That was a that was just a, a scientific statement. And my daughter, who was in medical school at the time, said, Mom, people who believe that you just die and then there's nothing else, if you are saying that there might be something after death, they take that as stuffing your religion down your, their, your, their throats. And so do you understand that it's actually a more faith-based thing to think that this is a good <laughs> than it is for us to say, well, we don't know. You know, that is, that's, that's faith-based. That's something that they believe, but there is absolutely no proof that the person's better off dead. And it's a little bit ironic that those of us who are Christians, who, who know that at some point we are going to be better off dead, are the ones who are fighting against this. Um, <clears throat> because of our our sovereign understanding, our position with God as our sovereign. So, you know, there's a lot in this whole debate and this whole discussion that shows us that um, there's a lot of spiritual blackness. And it's so sad how people are um, are are deluded and um, and confused by what's out there in the media and by what they're being told and how all of this is being romanticized and sold. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about autonomy later. But all right, so we say, okay, we have to have autonomy. So we're going to change our law. The law had to be changed so that a doctor or a nurse practitioner helping someone to die was not considered murder. The criminal code said if a doctor did that, that was murder. So the criminal code had to be changed to say that this was no longer going to be considered murder. All right, so that was done. And then we, I say, all right, so let's think about what you have to believe in order to, to, um, to make this change in the law. Because why do we have laws? <laughs> Well, we have laws to either hopefully to discourage bad things and to encourage good things. So we have a law to say um, <clears throat> you're not allowed to drink and drive. Okay, so that in encourages that discourages bad things. And we have a law that says you have to wear your seatbelt because we know that that is going to to help you and not you won't be um, usually, as harmed in, in a motor vehicle accident. Okay, so we have this, this balance. So in order to make a law that says that it's no longer going to be murder for a doctor or a nurse practitioner in, in some provinces to kill a patient, then what do you have to believe? What do you have to believe for that? To, to, to think that this is going to be a societal good. So I make the students think about this for a while. And so one of the things that you have to believe, I'm gonna mute myself again, I'm so sorry. Too early in the morning for me here, I guess. Okay, so one of the things you have to believe is that there are some lives that aren't worth living, okay? Because if we, if we believed that all lives were worth living and that every member of the human family uh, was worthy of respect and care, we would be providing support, not death. And it's kind of interesting because it's, it's not even the person who decides for the most part. The person may think his life isn't worth living, but if, if he's a a 25 year old who whose fiance just ran away um, on the day of the wedding and he decides he wants to be dead 
because he's so embarrassed that his, his fiance didn't show up for their wedding, then we would say, oh, no, you know, things will get better. We're not going to we're not going to give assisted suicide. We're not going to do a medical termination on you. You that's that's just out of the question. We're deciding that his life is worth living. Right. The system is he's not because he sure doesn't feel like it at that point. But let's say it's the same 25 year old that has a diving accident and he dives into a shallow lake and gets a spinal cord injury. And, and um, we know that it takes two years for the average person with a spinal cord injury to be able to come to terms with living with that. And many of them will say that their quality of life is as good or maybe even better than it was before. But it takes two years to go from that to that point. Almost every single person who's ever had a spinal cord injury has, has, uh, uh, has had suicidal thoughts. And because of the way the law is written, that person could be dead within days. <clears throat> so it's not even the person who is making the decision. It's our society who's deciding that some lives are not worth living. And I went and saw my member of parliament, which is something from part two that you can do. Um, so I went and saw my member of parliament and I said to her, you know, I'm really sad that in Canada, we've decided that some lives are not worth living. And she said, oh, I don't believe that at all. That's not what I believe. That's not what this is about. And I said, look, if the government is going to regulate, is going to pay for it, is going to train people to do this um, and choose who gets it and who doesn't, you, you've decided, we've decided that there are some lives that are not worth living. I don't care what you think you've thought, you've decided, but you've decided that. That's, that's just a fact. Okay, so the next thing that you have to believe in order to feel like this is a societal good is you have to believe that um, in some cases, killing is better than caring. OK, because that's what this is about. You have to believe that, OK, there's just going to be some some cases where we can't care enough. In fact, Roger Foley in Ontario, a um, um, young man with a disability, you can look look him up online. He uh, had had so many difficulties with caregivers. He'd been dragged across the floor with, by his hair. He'd gotten food poisoning a number of times because of the caregivers that were sent. And he said, I'm not going home from this hospital the last time he was admitted until I have more control over who takes care of me. And they said, well, we can't provide that kind of care for you. And two, he has recordings. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. He has recordings of two different healthcare workers who came into his hospital room, who said, you know, sorry, Roger, we can't provide that kind of care for you. Oh, brother. <clears throat> <clears throat> we can't provide that kind of care for you, but have you ever considered MAID? And so he's still in the hospital and they're trying to give him a bill. You know, he's a disabled man, he's living on a pension. They're trying to give him a bill for millions of dollars. He's um, he's taken it to the UN Human Rights. So it's quite an interesting it's quite an interesting story that he's brought attention to this. But this is what we've decided that there are some lives that aren't worth living. That killing is better than caring. It's certainly cheaper. They've already done studies to show that that oh, made is 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 helpful in the revenue side of things. Well, great. That that makes me really happy that. We've, we've put this price price on human life and we've done that. So <clears throat> you do have to believe that. You also have to believe that one of the high school students said, yeah, and you have to believe that the risks of this outweigh the benefits, right? The risks outweigh the benefits. And we've if, if we've gotten to the place where on Vancouver Island, one in every 10 deaths is a lethal injection, We've not just gone down a slippery slope. We've driven off the cliff. We've driven off the cliff. So these are these are some of the things that you you have to you have to believe, and that and also there's something within our laws that have been going on for 
especially in Hippocratic medicine for 2,400 years, that we don't kill each other. Um, and that you have to agree that at some point, that bright line of one member of the human family killing another member of the human family is blurred. Uh, now we understand about self-defense and I'm not gonna go into just war and all of that sort of thing. But ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the 10 commandments that we don't kill. <laughs> it's not nuanced. Everybody tries to say, you know, that to make this very complicated and complex. Oh, it's such a nuanced issue. You know what? The basic issue is not nuanced. We don't kill each other. We care for each other. That's what we do as members of the human family. Now, out in the public square, I certainly believe in the sanctity of life. But out in the public square, what I use, instead of saying, well, life is sacred, I say that I think we need to have respect for every member of the human family. Okay? And that includes supporting them, caring for them. And, you know, it's kind of interesting that some of the same people that are pushing for diversity, equity, and inclusion, all of those things, um, are pushing for MAID. And you think, okay, now, how is this helpful? <laughs> you know, where's the diversity for all these folks that are, are, are living with disabilities? Where's the equity? Where's the inclusion in, in saying, okay, if you want to die, we'll make you dead? You know, this is, it's, it's, very, it's very schizophrenic. Um, we, we have laws here, uh, I'm gonna, I'll talk about that in a minute, but so this idea that, that somehow we, we've, we're, we're crossing, we're, we're blurring that bright line that says we don't kill each other, all right? So those are the things. So think about that, what you actually have to believe if you think this is good for society, that some lives aren't worth living, that we can cross that bright line where one person in the human family takes the life of another, kills another, that the risks outweigh the benefits, and that caring is that killing is better than caring in some cases. And that to me is is pretty telling when you think about, well, if that if you have to believe those things, you actually believe those things if you support this law, then what does that say about us? You know, Canadians, we've had this this idea that we're very altruistic. We like we we don't mind standing in line. We have our healthcare system, and where we include we try to include everybody. It's a little bit on its last legs right now, and, and broken when when um, uh, we have a friend who's been waiting. He'll be, he'll, he will have waited two years to get neurosurgery for terrible pain in his neck and back, but he could be dead tomorrow. So, you know, there's there's some stuff that's that's messed up with our system, but it's part of our national identity that we care for each other. What is this going to do to our national psyche if we say, oh, you, you want to be dead? Well, fine, we'll make you dead. That's fine. Okay. So the big reason that people say, oh, well, you know, if you don't want to have it, you don't have to have it. But stay out of my life. So let's look at how uh, about autonomy. So so I asked the students, you know, do you have any limits to your autonomy already? So you think about the ways that you you have limits to your autonomy. How do what do we decide as a culture? And why do we do that? Well, we do it because we have at least <laughs> up until this point we have an idea of the common good. So we have things like laws against drunk driving. We say you have to pay your taxes. Um, and we go so far here in Vancouver, you're not allowed to smoke a cigarette outdoors on a public beach because it might affect somebody else's health. So we don't mind interfering with people's autonomy. You know, I can't keep a horse in my backyard. I can't keep... I can't have a little nuclear reactor here in my front yard so that I can live off the grid. Um, pesticides on lawns, you know, other things like this that have an impact on people around us. Um, I'm not allowed to do those things. And you know what? I'm glad that my neighbor's not allowed to keep a horse or a herd of goats or have a nuclear reactor. So, you know, th there's all those things that are there. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to, um, 
to lose some of my autonomy in those areas for the common good. And it's it's kind of a Christian principle, actually, that we each look out for, for each other. It's not kind of, it is a Christian principle that we do it. But, you know, we have to figure out where the extremes are. So this idea that somehow it's an autonomous decision to, to have somebody um, come and give you a lethal injection. Uh, this is just a, th this is a, a fallacy. So with the students, what I have them do is I ask them to tell me who all is involved in a medical termination. So I, I get them to stand up. So I have one person who volunteers to be the patient. So that person stands up and I say, okay, who else is involved? Well, the doctor, the nurse practitioner, okay. And the nurses and the social workers and the family and the friends and the clergy and the, um, uh, and the funeral director, okay. And the church community or the faith community, um, you know, the legislators who make the laws, the teachers who are teaching about this, uh, you can go on and on. I, I can get it to the place where if we've got a small enough class, everybody in the class is standing up. And then I say, look around you. How autonomous is this? If you get a rifle and go out behind the barn and kill yourself, or you stockpile some pills, or you go down and you get a big dose of fentanyl, which isn't that hard to come by, and you kill yourself. We, we all understand that that was an autonomous decision you made, but you know, it hurts our hearts. We are, we are really sad that you did that. And anyone who's ever been in a family or been a friend of someone who's committed suicide, you're always thinking, could I have seen this coming? Could I have helped to prevent this? And when you think about the difference between that, where the person wasn't actively participating in it, of course, unless they said, here's your gun, go get it over with. You know, I think there, there are ways and there are people who counsel suicide, but, you know, for the most part. But each of these people, so the pharmacist who, who prepares the medications, the doctor who gives it, the nurse who starts the IV, the, um, the social worker who's been counseling, the family members, the community, the, the, the funeral director and, and, and his crew, when, when they're dealing with this, even just how do you word an obituary when you're doing, when, when you're doing this, how does the, how do the family and friends talk about this? You know, all these people are involved. And when, when I, I say to the students, you, you see everyone standing up here, each one of those people represents a whole team of people who are caring for this patient, care aides and others who are there. Um, and what you don't see is the people behind them who are the bureaucrats and others who are pushing them to do more and to be more involved. You, you may have heard about our situation here in the Lower Mainland in, in Delta, uh, where the Delta Hospice Society ran a lovely little hospice that, that they raised the money locally, $8 million to build this, not one penny of government money went into building this little hospice. And they said that they did not want to um, provide, to allow MAID to take place on their premises. They were the only one in all of Fraser Health, which goes from Burnaby to Hope, okay? And they were the only one that said they didn't want to do it. They were right next door to the Delta Hospital who was willing to do it. And it would have taken less time to move someone from the Delta Hospice to the Delta Hospital than to move someone from one side of the Surrey Memorial Hospital to the other. And the government would not allow them. And it's right in their constitution that says, we're not gonna, we're gonna provide palliative care. We're not gonna provide, uh, we're not gonna hasten natural death. So the government went after them and they appropriated the land and the building they um, there was a, a terrible fight where they tried to even get other assets that they had that it had these interminable meetings where people were trying to disrupt the hospice society's work. Um, it, it's just it's been 
pretty, it was pretty awful. They didn't even want one institution with about eight beds, I think, to, to be able to have a place where um, people could go and, and not, not be in fear of this. So I had, I had a, a reporter phone me when it was determined that St. Paul's Hospital, which is a Catholic hospital, was not going to um, allow MAID at their facility. And the reporter phoned me and said, um, well, don't you think this is a terrible thing, that they won't allow this? And I said, well, actually, I, I sort of feel like if at that point it was only about 3% of people that were interested, said so if 97% of the people in, the, in, in British Columbia or in Vancouver want nothing to do with MAID, I think they need to have a euthanasia free zone where they can go and know that they're going to be safe. And even on that their worst day isn't going to be their last day. And even in a moment of weakness or um, despair, they ask for it, that it's not going to be available for them. I, I would like to have a place like that where, where even if I'm not quite myself, that people are not going to take me seriously when I say I want to be dead. Uh, after, after all I've done, <laughs> saying this is a bad idea. I don't want to just have this moment where where life just overwhelms me and I have my dark night of the soul and I say, well, just get it over with. Um, and she says to me, well, you don't get a choice as to where the ambulance takes you if you call somebody. And I said, well, you know, we move people all the time from one hospital to the other. If you're in Burnaby and you need um, cancer treatment, we put you in an ambulance and send you to the cancer agency. It's not a big deal. There isn't a lot of pain involved with that. Um, we we move people all the time. And she says to me, this, I'm not kidding. She says, well, what if, what if you, the person dies before they get a chance to have this? And I said to her, think about what you just said. You just said it would be too bad if the person died before we got a chance to kill them. I mean, that's what she was saying. And, you know, Donald Lowe, who was uh, one of the, uh, one of the people who was the, when SARS came out, he was the public health doctor that was the face of that in Ontario, and he was very articulate. And he he made a video about how we needed, when he got brain cancer later, and he made a video about how he needed to get, we needed to get over it and, and, and just pass this because he should be able to have it when he wanted. And um, I was interviewed for a, an article, a news article, and his wife was interviewed as well. And she said that he died, he, even though he died completely comfortable, surrounded by his loved ones at home, that it wasn't a dignified death because he hadn't been able to have the lethal injection that he wanted. And she said that he really wasn't very conscious. He wasn't in pain or anything, but he didn't have a lot of consciousness for the last couple of weeks of his life. And she said, why should I have had to spend that time with a corpse, with a corpse? So, you know, there's, there's all sorts of reasons that are, are out there for us to, to be very wary of this culture that is saying to us um, that, that those around us who are um, in need of our care that we're it's like living with a corpse or that we have this that if if we get to the place where we take up too many resources or too much care that we have a duty to do this um i will tell you after the break about what a friend of mine um, experienced on Vancouver Island in helping someone who was trying to think through these issues. But um, I know that a lot of the things that I've said today have been a little depressing when we think about where our culture is. But little is much when the Lord is in it. And we're called to this time right now to do what we can with what we have, where we are. And he is uh, he's the great multiplier. He can help us to do that. And as the, light, as, as the light gets darker from without, we can shine our little candles even better. 
So um, I'm, I'm sorry if this has been um, a bit of a wake up call for you about how normalized uh, things are. Uh, I'll give you one last example of that um, and you can chat among yourselves during the break. Um, there's, you can actually get continuing medical education credit. This is in one of those articles. You can get continuing medical education credit through the University of British Columbia um, if you, if you um, take this little continuing medical education online course called Normalizing Made for Children. So the doctor is a, a maid provider and she says, if the adults normalize it, the children will normalize it. So when she goes to a home to um, do a, a medical termination, she, and there's children present, she puts all of her things on the table and she calls the children over and she says, these are the things I'm going to use to help your loved one die. And then she does it. And then afterward, she says right in this article, she refuses to call the patient by a name. She won't say that's mother or grandfather or sister or whatever. She just says it's the body because she's decided that it's only a body and that the person's gone. And somehow, you know, she's making that decision for the family. There's, there's so many things that are wrong with that. But that's, that's where we've come to in Canada. We have um, one of the most um, open uh, euthanasia policies in the whole world. Uh, in fact, in one of the last years that we have statistics for, um, we had more than this now, but where there were comparable statistics, Canada and California have about the same population they have about the same demographic and the same politics, and they, the, uh, they've had assisted suicide in California for about the same amount of time that we've had euthanasia. In the last, in the year that I'm talking about where we had a comparison, they had about two to 300 deaths in California, and we had over 10,000. So, you know, we've, we've got to wake up and figure out what we can do. Um, that we're, we're not facing what the early Christians faced. We're not facing a lot of other things, but we're called to deal with what we find in our own communities and in our own culture right now. And um, so uh, I guess I've given you a little bit of a wake up call and um, we'll, we'll take a 10 minute break and come back after that. Then I'll, I'll, I'll try to give you a little more, more hope and I'll go let my puppy out. I hope she hasn't, you haven't been hearing her. I've been hearing her. <clears throat> uh, I remember uh, being in a presentation with some others and some of the first words out of, out of our mouths were, we had no idea. Um, but this is reality, whether it's comfortable to face that reality or not. Um, so thank you for leading us through this. Um, we are going to take that 10 minute break now. Just a couple of reminders for you. Um, we are going to have another presentation and of course our question and answers to finish off. If you are in person, again, washrooms are over here. Refreshments are available over at the kitchen window. Uh, you can please start dropping off your um, questions here for our question and answer time in the basket. And according to me, it is 11.04, so we will reconvene in exactly 10 minutes. Thank you.
I encourage you to find a seat now. We'll start here just in about uh, 20 seconds or so, so please grab a seat. That's a question for us, not, I mean, read it, read it, but we're talking that death is not normal. Mm -hmm. We put it in institutional, how many people yeah. have been there? Yeah. Have you? Yes. Maybe as a pastor. Yeah. Yeah. But ask here. All right, folks, uh, it is time for us to reconvene. Welcome back. I hope that you've been able to feel a bit refreshed. And thank you, uh, Dr. Cottle, for showing us those very tempting photos uh, or a video of your puppy. Uh, we will probably go and adopt one this afternoon now. <laughs> but uh, as mentioned before, our next presentation will be more practical. Um, we've received a, a good amount of information and stories here, but we want to be better equipped with um, what we can do with this information now in our spheres of family and friends and even in our workplaces and so on. Um, so we'll turn things back over to you uh, for this next presentation. And if I look distracted by anyone, I'll be combing through these um, questions here that many of you have been submitting. And uh, when Dr. Cottle concludes, we'll head directly into our Q&A time, which will take us until 12 o'clock. Um, so I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Is that okay? I, I, okay, good. Just we had a little trouble at the beginning, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't just talking to myself. Um, <clears throat> yes, so what do we do about this? I think the first thing is that that what we've had to do as palliative care physicians is we've had to uh, do something biblical. We've had to lament um, just to cry out to God that this is something that makes us sad, that we're upset about, that we know it doesn't please him. Um, a little bit like Daniel talking about uh, how he prays for his people and he talks about um, how that he's praying for the, the sins of all the people. And I feel a little bit that if Jesus were to look at Canada right now, he would feel like he did about Jerusalem, that um, we're like sheep without a shepherd. And he would, he wished to call us to himself, but we wouldn't come. And so I think the first thing that each of us can do is to pray. And I know that sounds very glib, but prayer is the shovel that digs under the wall. If you can't get through it because you don't have the keys, if you can't get over it you because you can't get that high, um, you can't go around, you just get your little prayer shovel out and you keep digging. And there are so many uh, stories from the Bible and other, uh, other great Christian literature, et cetera, where the people who were praying had no idea what impact they were having. And people who were praying had uh, no idea how, um, how the some of the things that may have been prevented or that had been uh, promoted by their prayers. So please do not take that as something that's just an offhand thing. Prayer is the work. It's the basis of, of what we do. And asking the Lord to, to uh give us eyes to see and ears to hear so that we can be like people of Matthew 25, where those who are sick and injured and in prison, maybe it's in it's sort of an imprisonment of a type with a disability where they're stuck inside or stuck in a facility, that type of thing, that we can be the ones to visit, to help, to uh, care for them, all of those types of things. So I think, um, just having a, the right mindset to start with, asking, praying, where can we be? Where can we be involved? And, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be on a national basis. Although talking to your member of parliament 
and uh, supporting your member of parliament. I, I don't know whether any of you have Garnet Genis as your member of parliament or not, but he has been a great friend to, uh, to life. And so um, supporting um, his work in, in those areas would be something I would certainly, certainly encourage because he's had the courage to speak up in the middle of parliament where, um, and say, you know, that, that this is a bad idea. So um, that would be one thing. Speaking to your member of parliament, speaking to your MLAs, uh, one of the things that has happened uh, across the country is that, and it's just being discussed right now in Nova Scotia. Now, fortunately in Alberta, it does not, it's not the case as yet anyway, but there are a number of provinces, Ontario um, is one of them, where a doctor who has conscientious objection to participating in <clears throat> or is doing any assessments for medical termination for MAID is required by law to make what they call an effective referral, which means they're required to send that person to someone they know will carry it out. Now, in Canada, we don't have capital punishment, and um, we understand that if someone has been accused of a capital crime in a state like Texas, that if we extradite that person, that if we make an effective referral, that we have participated, we are complicit in uh, an execution. So as, as a country, we will not extradite a prisoner to a jurisdiction that has capital punishment unless we have a written guarantee that the person will not face execution. So <clears throat> somehow the government feels that um, it's, it's, it's complicit if they do that, but it's not complicit if a doctor is forced to make a referral to a nurse practitioner or a physician who will quote unquote provide made, um, even if they don't feel like it's the best uh, clinic, even the best clinical situation or indicated for their patient. So doctors who refuse to do this are at risk of losing their license. Um, and in fact, there's a, a, a group of um, medical, so-called medical ethicists who feel like no one should be admitted to medical school who is not willing to perform everything that's legal. So if you want to be an eye doctor, <clears throat> you shouldn't be allowed to go to medical school unless you're willing to perform abortions, for example. So if we want to have Christian doctors, we need to have the public speaking up for conscience protection. And there, um, there are some places that you can do that, um, that uh, there's a, a website um, called No Options, No Choice. And that has all sorts of ways that you can, uh, you can find out about what's going on. There's, there are some little vignettes that was, I, you'll get stuck seeing me a little bit in there too, but it was produced um, about a year and a half ago um, with a professional uh, team and they did a great job. There's also a series called Dying with Christ, Living with Hope, <clears throat> that your your church or your group could could uh, do, and it just needs to have a, a facilitator who's done uh, a, uh, some training, a little bit of training, but it's a, a really good way of thinking about how we think about death and how we care for each other. So those those are two two things, no options, no choice, and having a look at, especially um, one of the people whose story is told <clears throat> Um, is a woman who's living with a disability, and she she Tracy is her name, and she talks about what it what, what that as a young person she might have <clears throat> she might have chosen uh, made if she had to go to an institution, and she she's of such an age that she was able to go to high school only if she said that she didn't need to go to the the bathroom the whole day while she was there because they didn't have any accessible toilets. Otherwise, she would have had to just not stayed home and not gone to high school. So we need to, you know, be thinking about um, systemic things like that. But to be honest, it it really 
doesn't take more than about one person <laughs> in a lot of cases to help someone change their mind about this, to let them know that they are cared for, that they're loved. Um, one of my friends uh, from a different city called me one day and she said, I don't know what to do. This person, this lady just called me. We're acquaintances, we're not good friends, but she said, I'm thinking about MAID and I don't think you're in favor of it, which she wasn't. Uh, and she said, and I wanna know the reasons why. And she called me up and said, what do I say to her? I don't know what to say. And so I, I talked to her and she told me this woman's medical history. And she would have qualified for MAID about 10 times over. She had a very thick chart. She had chronic pain. She had several, she'd been to, she'd even managed to get an appointment to the pain management team. Um, she'd had lots of different procedures. She had, had had surgeries. She had autoimmune stuff. I mean, it was it was a long list of things. And to be honest, it was one of those things where um, if I'm looking at a chart, I'm thinking I can see why this person has maybe just had enough and, you know, nothing is kind of going to take her life right away, but she's just had enough with all of this and, and it would be tempting. Well, um, I asked my friend about her and I said, well, one of the things that seems to be helpful is to uh, ask some of the questions that the that we ask when we're talking in about dignity therapy. And some of these questions are really interesting. You ask a person, when, when did you feel most alive? When did you feel most alive? Um, what roles are you most uh, uh, proud of that you've played in your life? Uh, are there any things that you still want to say to your family? What are your hopes and dreams for your family? Um, what, you know, those, those types of questions, asking them uh, those, those sorts of questions. There's a whole list of things. And if you go to um, Cancer Care Manitoba, they have uh, these dignity questions are, are listed right on their website there under the uh, dignity care. And the, the man who pioneered dignity conserving care is Dr. Harvey Max Chachinoff, and his name is spelled C-H-O-C-H-I-N-O-V, his last name. And if you Google him and you, you say dignity therapy or dignity conserving care, a lot of things will come up. And he's been writing quite a bit in the popular press lately. He's my mentor. Um, and he's a psychiatrist, a palliative care psychiatrist at the University of Manitoba. And he's been, he's been writing a lot in the popular press. And one of the things he said is, we, we don't really need made. We need and, and we don't need a lot of intensive care for people at the end of life. We need in, like the machines and everything. We need intensive caring. We need intensive caring. And I really like that idea that, that what we have to provide is intensive caring. Um, yes, so he's, he's just wonderful. And the, the other thing that he has pioneered is what's called the, the dignity question. Now he started studying the concept of dignity back in the 1990s when he started hearing that the reason why people in the Netherlands wanted to have um, uh, a, a euthanasia death, a medical termination was because of a lack of dignity. And he said, <clears throat> okay, well, well, what are the determinants of dignity? How do we figure out how to conserve dignity, what makes up dignity. And he has, he's done all sorts of research, but there's one question that they've come up with that's really good. And you can ask this question too. You can say, they say, what do we need to know about you as a person in order to give you the best care possible? And I thought that was, it's really interesting. One of the answers that they got in Manitoba was a woman said to them, well, um, I guess you would. it would be important for you to know, which they didn't know this, that I'm a survivor of the residential school system. And any 
symbol of authority like a white coat makes me nervous. And I'm very nervous if anyone enters my room without knocking. And he said, do you think that changed how we cared for this lady? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. So just asking, you know, what do we need to know about you as a person in order to come alongside you and give you the best care possible? That I also have a question that I use that I call my magic question. And what I ask people is, what's the worst part of this for you? What's the worst part of this for you? And, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, it's very seldom pain. I've had answers like, well, I gave up a child for adoption 40 years ago, and I always wondered how she turned out. Um, I, another one, I've been estranged from my brother in Montreal for the last five years, and I would like to reconnect. So those are things that we can do something about, or at least we can try. And so if that's the worst part of it, uh, how much we lose if when somebody says, I wish I were dead, that we just say, okay, we'll call the maid team. Because that's what is being, um, that, that's what's being promoted as the only way to, an to answer someone who says, I wish I were dead. Uh, which is very sad. Our palliative care training said that when somebody says, I wish I were dead, the, the first thing you do is you ask why. You know, what is it that's so hard that you wish you were dead? And if, if nobody is going to actually kill you, you have more freedom to ask that question, to say that thing. You have more freedom to be open about how you're feeling and how you're despairing if they're not going to take you seriously. If you say, gosh, I wish I were dead, um, and they say, okay, we'll call the maid team and make it happen, That's you, you, you have to hold that inside, that despair that you're having inside, um, if, if that's the way people are going to interpret it, rather than Oh well, what? How is this? How how is this bad for you? What's the worst part of this? How can we help you? We talk about the idea of reframing hope. So how do we help this person to reframe hope? Maybe it's not that the person is going to uh, be able to be there to see grandchildren married in 10 years, but maybe it will be that they'll see the new baby born. You know, we, we don't know exactly what it is. And there are many ways that people have, have um, been very creative in how they have uh, reframed hope in their lives. Uh, one, one young mother said, I don't want anybody else to talk to my girls about the birds and the bees. So she made videos. Somebody came to her house and she made videos telling them the facts of life because she wanted to be the one to do it. And she was passing away. Uh, one grandmother, when I was a uh, physician in Halifax, one grandmother went down to the Burke's jewelry store in downtown Halifax. And she had granddaughters who were about eight and 10. And she chose a birthday gift for each of them right up through their 21st birthday and had it kept in Burke's vault. And that was given to the girls uh, up until they turned 21 each, each year. Um, you know, things like that, that can give hope to the person who's still alive and, and do what Doc, Dame Cicely Saunders, who was the doctor who founded the modern hospice movement, she said, we, um, that we are going not only to care for you while you're dying, but you matter just because you are you and you matter until the very end of your life. And not only will we help to care for you but as while you're living, but we will help you live your life to the very end. So that's a bit of a paraphrase, but that's, that's her philosophy. And that's the, been the philosophy of hospice and palliative care. Um, down through the years. And it's been very sad for those of us who have been involved in it for a long time that the governments have been forcing palliative care units and hospices to participate in, in uh, medical termination. And uh, there are even funds in Ontario, for example, the, the funding for, uh, 
for people to go out and and perform made is taken out of the palliative care budget. So, you know, there's there's a lot of sad things that that are happening there. And um, it's um, and I do, I actually don't know what's going to happen in terms of the future, whether I know that the Delta Hospice Society is trying to raise enough money to build a new facility and to be able to run it without any government money. Now, the problem is, is that the government, uh, I think that there is this sense that for people who are involved in this, there's uh, Jay Budjashevsky wrote a book about common law called What We Can't Not Know. And I think Romans 1 talks about what our consciences will tell us, even when we don't understand what we're thinking. But there's there's a push for people who think this is a great idea to wipe out any opposition to this. Because if anyone stands up holding up a mirror to say, you can do it a different way, then they know in their, their heart that it isn't the right thing that they're doing and there's somebody else who's doing it differently. So even if the Delta Hospice Society does this, um, all the government has to do is to say, we're not going to accredit you um, or the insurance companies. And if you're not accredited, then you can't get workers comp for your uh, employees. You can't get insurance for your building, um, all of those kinds of things. And uh, it may come to the place where we as Christians will have to care for one another in our own homes, like, like we did back in the days with Anne of Green Gables and, and uh, Little House on the Prairie, where we, we took turns helping each other and we cared for each other in our home. If the government says we will not allow a facility to exist that doesn't um, provide some way for uh, patients to be killed. So, you know, uh, I, I don't, we aren't there yet. And the more that you get involved and speak to your health authorities, speak to your members of parliament, speak to your, the members of your legislative assembly. I don't know whether it's an MLA there in Al where you are or an MPP or whatever. Uh, and even speaking to your local governments, if they're licensing some of these facilities, that makes a difference. Um, the other thing is just looking around you. The, the number of people who actually had, had made because they were lonely was, was remarkable. Uh, there are people who are having this because they're lonely, because they haven't got a, a safe place to live. So we, if we can do things to support folks. Now, there are a lot of people who are homeless who have serious mental health issues. And it's not simply just to, you know, invite them to live in your basement. That That's not going to work. But maybe we can help um, our governments figure out about spending more money in helping folks like this so that they're not thinking that this is their only choice. Um, I was on a radio program one time and the person on the other side of this issue said, oh, Dr. Cottle, don't be so sure that you're opposed to MAID until you've been in a, an old folks home and a nursing home. You might want it yourself someday. And I said, well, you know, to me, it's actually bordering on obscene if the way we're treating our seniors is that they'd rather be dead than live in a facility that um, we're providing for them as a culture after they've worked all their lives to support our society and to raise their families. If they'd rather be dead than live in a place like that, then that's on us. That's an obscenity that that is there and a blot on our uh, a blot on our country and our culture. Um, you know the the fact that someone. Uh, would rather be dead than than live in a facility. And when you think about this, um, we're we're building a new children's hospital here in Vancouver, and it's the second new children's hospital since I went to medical school. So I'm not saying we don't need it, but look at the difference in how we treat our seniors 
and how we treat our kids. If you go to a children's hospital, the the, the there's little toilets for the little kids and, and there's bright colors on the wall and it's easy to find your way back to where your little section is. And they have play therapy and they have music and they have all these things that everybody's upbeat and, and rooting for you. If you if you go to some of the senior center and, and and even though a lot of those kids are incontinent, the place does not smell like urine. You go to a senior center half the time and in a hospital it's always in the worst part of the hospital the oldest part there's the color of the paint on the wall sucks all the light out of the room oftentimes there aren't any uh, accommodations for people that are needing uh, extra help with their toileting and other things like that there's not enough staff to to cover things um what's wrong with us you know, we can pay somebody $8 million a year to push a puck around the ice and we can't take care of our seniors. You know, God help us seriously that we're, what are we doing um, with our culture? And we, we are, um, we are being seduced by comfort um, to be part of a society that values, um, human life and every member of the human family so poorly. Uh, uh, Garnet Genesis' brother, Quentin, is an emergency room doctor here in Vancouver, and he talks about caring for one another as providing hospitality for those who are the most frail among us. And, you know, that's, that's what um, that's what the Christian life is all about, is providing hospitality. And um, we even have the promise that sometimes we'll be providing hospitality for angels um, without knowing it. So um, are there ways that you can look around in your own community, in your own family, and visit with people? I know that um, there are lots of seniors' homes that it would be great if uh, if you could take an iPad or a computer into a senior's home and help us, the seniors uh, connect with their loved ones in other places, they just can't figure that out. You know, um, they said, you know, I need to call the grandchild to come and, and do it for them. But just are there ways that you can help them connect? Are, you, are there ways that you can say you matter just because you're you, you matter to us? This idea of dignity is not something that um, you earn or that you can lose. Dignity is who you are because you're a child of God. You're made in the image of God. And if you're not feeling dignified, that's our problem. That's our problem. That's on us. If you're not feeling dignified, it's up to the rest of us to come alongside you, lift you up and help you back to a place where you're feeling dignified. And um, you know, folks who are living with disabilities are saying, if the reason that people are being killed is that they need help with their toileting, they need help with um, their mobility, they need help with their activities of daily living, what does that say about us? So, you know, we need to be, be thinking about our language. The other thing um, that some of the folks will say to us is that, we need to watch our language. So other than the way it's said in the Bible where we, we shouldn't alter things, but when we're talking about people, not to say the disabled, um, the sick, the terminally ill, but say people who are living with a disability, persons who are uh, at the end of life, that type of thing. It's called people first language. And um, it's it's really important to do that because uh, I had some folks from good friends from the disability community say, you know, we really like what you're saying at some of these things, but don't call us the disabled because we are not our adjectives. Okay. We are people first. And by doing that, it's the, the first step in dehumanizing people. So I'm going to start answering questions, but I want to uh, tell you this, this story of my friend. So she, I talked to her and I said, ask her about 
what legacy she wants to leave for her grandkids. Does she have grandkids? Yes, she does. Well, and if it's okay for grandma to check out when things get too hard, what is what kind of a legacy is that going to leave for the grandkids? And there were a whole bunch of other things that we talked about too, but that was the one that landed for her. And she decided she she was she had already been assessed and approved for it. And she decided she wasn't going to do it. And about 18 months later, this woman, uh, oh, and she didn't want her grandchildren to see her in pain. That was one of the things. Anyway, 18 months later, this uh, woman called up my friend and said, I want to take you out to lunch to celebrate because um, I didn't go through with it. Um, I have gotten some help. My grandchildren can now even come over and stay overnight. And even though I'm, I I'm still have uh, aids to help me walk and other things, I'm so glad that I didn't check out 18 months ago. And, you know, it was one person who spoke into her life and said, what about your grandkids? What are you going to, what legacy are you going to leave for them? And um, uh, never think that what you're doing is nothing. The I love the little story of the boy who's, down at the ocean and there's been a super super high tide and all the starfish are up out of the water big wash of the starfish and he's down there throwing them one at a time out into the ocean where they can stay alive and this person comes along and says what are you doing there's just way too many of them it's it's not going to matter and the boy just keeps throwing them. And he says, don't you get it? It's not going to matter. And he looks at the, the person and says, it'll matter to this one. And he throws that one. It'll matter to this one. So the Lord has put some of those starfish right in front of you. And it's important for you to ask him um, who they are and um, what you can do. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be big. You'll probably know in your own life some of those little moments where someone has just put an arm around you or made a phone call or sent you a note that have made all the difference. So, you know, I just would encourage you to, to do that. Um, I, I do have a whole pre presentation on dignity conserving care that if you're <laughs> If you're glad, could come another time and do. It has some PowerPoint slides and some more stuff. But I think you've probably had enough for now. That's for sure. So we'll uh, we'll we'll go on to some of the questions. I think Jeff. Microphone is working here for the audience so that they can hear me as well. Are we okay there. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, thank you again for that presentation. Um, uh, just as a point of curiosity, Garnet Jens actually is our local MP that uh, we're in this jurisdiction and uh, kind of a little factoid that many of you might not know, when Garnet was younger, he actually attended our church um, and was baptized here as a younger man. I don't think we can take too much credit for who he's ended up to be, but uh, whatever sliver we can, we will. <laughs> um, but, That's great. Uh, yeah, we've known uh, Sheila. We've known his family for a long time, and they stayed at our house when they're all five of them, little kids sleeping on our floor. So it's great to see them. Uh, and his brother Quentin is amazing too. They're they're all. It's an amazing family. Hmm. So we have uh, received a total of 15 questions. I know that we will not get to all of them uh, whatsoever, but uh, I've grouped together kind of a family of some of them. You already answered a few though, which was, which was great. But the first two questions that I'll have us uh, explore are kind of process questions. And then our third question is going to be a clarity question. And if we can get to a fourth question, the fourth question is about uh, perhaps some exceptions. So we'll see where this goes. So the first process question uh, says this, in your talk, the implication is that made is easy to get quickly. What exactly is the process? And maybe I'll just add, what exactly is the process as it stands right now in the Canadian legal landscape? Okay. Um so I'll have to probably, you'll probably need to mute your thing while I'm talking so that I don't hear you. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so it, it varies from province to province, the process. Um, here in British Columbia, 
it's it's actually a simple little checklist and it's it's simpler and easier to get approved for made in British Columbia than it is to get approved for home oxygen. Um, you have to provide more data. Uh, you have to provide uh, some statistics about your oxygen saturation, et cetera, in order to qualify for home oxygen. But it's a simple little checklist for made. And when the law changed, um, when they amended the law that you didn't have, your death didn't have to be reasonably foreseeable. At that time, there, it, there was a reflection period of uh, 10 days and you had to have two dispassionate witnesses to witness your signature. Now there is no waiting period at all, zero waiting, and you only need one witness and that person can be someone who would benefit from your death like a caregiver. So technically, be, and because it's a medical procedure, which I, I actually dispute, but anyway, that's the way it's qualified, then you have complete uh, confidentiality. So if technically you could go to your oncologist, uh, an oncology appointment in the morning, let's say your family doctor ordered a scan, found out there was something going on, you could go to an oncology appointment, find out that you had uh, a cancer that was had spread, and if you said, I don't want any treatment or anything else, I just want to be dead. Um, if the red tape were not, this is one place where I'm happy for a bit of red tape. With, if the red tape was not a problem, then you could, you could actually be dead before your family even knew you'd had the diagnosis. You could be dead that afternoon. There's no waiting period. In fact, um, Garnet's brother, Quentin, who's the ER doc, he had a colleague of his approach him, another ER doc approach him and say, hey, don't you think we all us ER docs that we ought to become made assessors? Because you have to have two assessments. And if the person comes in and has had a stroke or something else uh, that they really don't want to keep living, we could do the first assessment and then we could call the maid team and they could come down and do the second assessment and the person would never even have to be admitted to hospital or anything, have anything ongoing. So it's um it's not much of a process um there are at the moment there there are two streams so if your death is reasonably foreseeable you can be dead without a waiting period if your death is not reasonably foreseeable say you have terrible osteo osteoarthritis or kidney disease or something like that then you have to wait 90 days and you have to be seen by someone who has some training in the area where you have the illness. So you have to be seen by a kidney specialist or whatever. But the the people who are on the MAID team have their own little stable of specialists where if somebody asks for it, they they get the their own favorite kidney doctor or whatever to, you know, to to do the assessment. So it's it's not very protective. And there's also a a provision that if you say you want to live past Christmas, but you're worried that you're not going to be able to give consent after Christmas. Well, if you are qualified before Christmas and you say, I want to, I want to die on January 3rd and you're no longer, and you sign it that you, that you're no longer able to give consent as long as you don't, and this is what the, the way the law says it, as long as you don't actively fight them on the third, you can still you 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 can still be euthanized on the third, even though you can't really give consent at that point because you said before that you wanted to have it then. So that's kind of where we are. Um, it's it's wide open basically. I even know of one case here in British Columbia where a doctor went to see a patient who had um, who had multiple sclerosis and was not in his terminal phase, but he was in a nursing home in a double room and not very happy. And she said to him, well, you know, you're in, you're bedridden and you might get bed sores and the bed sores might get infected. And if you chose not to have treatment, that might kill you. So you would qualify. And she euthanized him. 
Okay, our, our next question is another process question, but it's kind of asking, um, kind of from the other side, as it were, uh, for a person might, that might be considering uh, palliative care, um, and I know that every case is unique, but uh, as best as you can answer, what plans are in place for pain control and end-of-life care in a palliative setting? Help people understand what that process could look like now as compared to the one you just described. Yeah. Well, part of the problem is that when this law was brought in, there were these big promises. Oh, we're going to really fund palliative care so that this is really only going to be a last resort kind of thing. And, you know, ha ha, did not happen. So um, even though the, the government has chosen to say that this is a right to have made, you do not have a right to palliative care. The, the studies that have been done show that about 30 to 50% of Canadians have access to adequate palliative care. Um, and so we need to fight for more of that. Now, uh, we're very good at controlling pain and symptoms. And if a person is having a, a terrible time, it's, it's more about uh, getting better care so sometimes that means that a person needs to go to more of a, a tertiary center. We have several of those here in Vancouver and they have them. There's some good centers there in Edmonton and uh, Calgary and other places. Even some of the smaller places have, have some good palliative care. So it's, it's not about the fact that it isn't, a, it isn't possible. It's whether or not um, people know about it, whether they're willing to um, push to get it, you know, that sort of thing. We even have um, some really uh, unique things coming down the line for uh, some sedation that will help people who are maybe agitated at the end of life. Um, you know, there's, it's, it is, it's, it's complex, but uh, the, the really interesting question is, why is it that right now, when we have the best pain control we've ever had, the best symptom control we've ever had, um, the, the best sort of understanding <clears throat> of supportive care, that there's this big push to have people have their lives taken by lethal injection. You know, that's the question. <clears throat> Back when there was no anesthetic, <laughs> for example, and you were gonna die with a gangrenous leg, if you didn't have it cut off without an anesthetic, you know, there's there were some <laughs> there there were a lot more reasons why you might want to just have somebody shoot you than than go through some of those things. But now where we've got we've got really excellent care. I had a young man at home who I was part of the home care team who had a, a pretty nasty cancer, but he was able to stay home with um a lidocaine, a, a, a lidocaine drip uh, into his, uh, I'll just put leave it as a lidocaine drip, that the nurses came and checked it every day and he had good pain control. He did Lego with his five-year-old daughter. You know, all of these things were able to happen. And uh, the difference in the 30 years that I have seen is we're, we're much better at pain control and controlling symptoms. It's not really about that as much as it is about control. But I would say if someone is suffering and is having a lot of trouble with symptoms, uh, pain and symptoms, then you know you need to holler and you need to say, this is not good enough. We might only have time for one more question, so I'm going to try and wrap a few into one. <laughs> uh, so the, the question here is, uh, have we also come to a point where we use machines or resources to extend life unnaturally without extending some quality of life? Uh, a way that a, a similar sounding question, maybe just saying it a different way, is if a terminally ill person opts not to allow doctors to intervene, for example, with chemo or those kinds of things. Is that a kind of suicide? Okay, so I'm glad you asked those questions. Uh, first of all, um, <clears throat> first of all, no, it's not a suicide if you decide to just, what we would say, let nature take its course. That's not a suicide. It's never been considered a suicide. 
Um, and even doing things like taking out a, a breathing tube, if, it, if, if the reason that you're discontinuing something is that it's, it's too much for the person, or then uh, discontinuing that thing is not, uh, is not a suicide. Okay, I'll come back to that. But this idea that somehow people are being le uh, hooked up to machines and left there too long, that was something from 20 or 30 years ago. That is not your worry now. Your worry now in the hospital is that they're going to say, oh, you've had your little trial of this, um, you know, sayonara. You've had enough. You're using resources. This idea that people are being kept on machines against their will, that is not happening today. I'm here to tell you. What's happening is more likely that they're, they, people will give up on you. Uh, because of this big shift in how we see patients, and oh, and, and it's all done under oh, the person is suffering too much. You know, we need to call in the main team, and maybe they've had enough, and this sort of thing. Um, you know, that that is that's not your. There may be an occasional case like that, but for the most part, that's not the issue. Now, this this idea of stopping treatment. So. One of the doctors from Edmonton, uh, Arnie Voth, used to say, we deal with living when living with the issue, and we deal with dying when dying is the issue, okay? So what you need to think about is this idea of intent. This is really important. Intent is the basis of all of Western law. It's not motivation. It's not, are you motivated? by mercy. It's intent. Did you intend to kill? All right. So people will say, oh, well, that makes no difference. The person's just as dead. Okay. So I'll tell, I'll, we'll, we'll try this little experiment. I tell you that before we, this started this morning, uh, I was out of my car and I ran over a young boy on the street in front of my house and I killed him. What's my punishment? Well, you can't tell me because if I was driving the speed limit, I wasn't texting, I wasn't drunk, um, my, the brakes on my car were fine, and I, the, this child ran out in front of me with the, to chase a ball and everybody saw that I tried to stop, he's still just as dead if I killed him, but I wouldn't be charged at all. But if any of those other things was involved, like, being on texting or knowing that my car didn't have brakes or speeding or drunk or any of those things, then that's that's a, another level of of intent of of understanding that this could have been reasonably foreseeable that I did this. And if I hated the little brat and I waited around the corner till he was going off to soccer practice and ran him down on purpose, that's he's still just as dead. Okay. But I, that's first degree murder because I intended it. I did it with my car, vehicular homicide, I guess. But, you know, this idea that intent doesn't matter is just garbage because we, if we are, now, I want you to know that for most of the time, giving pain medications does not hasten death. In fact, it tends to actually smooth things out so the person can rest. Now, sometimes it gets a little tricky in some of the nursing homes where if they're feeling like, well, if they give too much, then the person gets to the place where they're so dopey that they're not eating. And then they say, oh, well, they're palliative. So, you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if we're, if we're all on the up and up here and the person, what, what you decide is, if the person says, this is just too much for me, I don't want to continue with this then. And, or if you're saying, I want to give pain medication, okay, I'm going to give a higher dose of pain medication, even if it may depress um, some of the respirations. I'm not doing it to, I'm not making the person dead in order to, to relieve the suffering. I'm taking a risk that's a calculated risk where the benefits outweigh the risks, and I'm doing it with the intent to help, not the intent to kill. Now, there was a famous case in Nova Scotia of a respirologist where the patient had uh, had, had enough and he wanted to be uh, not to have the tube down his throat anymore. And the family said, yes, they agreed with that. 
and she took the tube out and he didn't die. And because she had taken the tube out and the family had taken the tube out thinking that this guy was going to die, <clears throat> instead of just giving him good palliative care, um, giving him sedatives, giving him you know, what he needed in that moment, she, she injected potassium chloride into this man, which there was no therapeutic value of that. It was intending to kill him. And the only reason she wasn't charged is that he was so close to death when she did that, that they didn't feel like they could prove in court that it was the potassium chloride that killed him. But that's the difference. <clears throat> you have no obligation to continue with any treatment that is too onerous for you. You notice I'm not using the word burden because that's been, or, and the other word I'm not using is futile because both of those words have been used against patients to say, oh, well, it's just futile to treat you. Uh-uh, I don't use that word. No, caring is never futile. Now, it may not, the treatment may not produce the effects that we're hoping for, but we we deserve some time to process that, to figure it out, to help the family process things, to make it so that we're as gentle as possible when we're doing these things. And at the end of life, the Lord, man, we're so fearfully and wonderfully made. The Lord has made it so that when the dying process comes, people are afraid that it's going to be very, um, very uh, violent, like it is on TV. And for the most part, it's a, it's a quiet thing. The person tends to get sleepier and sleepier. The breathing tends to get shallower and shallower and finally just stops. That's the usual process of what it's like to die. It's not what happens on TV where people are choking and doing all these other things. It's usually very quiet. And in fact, sometimes it's hard for families to know if the, when the person actually passes away. So, and when the person is in that active state of dying, there is a natural dehydration process that takes place because the lungs tend to fill up with fluid if if the person's drinking a lot or having a lot of intravenous fluid. So this they, they don't have an appetite. They don't tend to be thirsty. We keep their mouth moist. We offer um, swabs. We offer ice chips. If they want to drink, they can drink. If they want to eat, they can. But we just, we don't force it. And we, it, in all the studies that have been, have been done, it, it does not show that the death is either prolonged or shortened by the dying process by those things. So um, I, Jeff, Pastor Jeff has my email address. And if there's something that I've said today that you need to discuss further or you want to just um, set up a phone call with me, I do that and I don't charge anything for doing that. Um, I, I want you to feel comfortable that there is enough care out there for you if, if you can get access to it. You know, I know that that's the big if, um, but however it comes, however we come around, that we're not to despise the gift of life. The Lord is the author and the creator of life. He says in Psalm 139 that all the days that are for us are written in his book before one of them comes to be. And we're not to jump in and, and, and do that. Um, it's not going to bring shalom if we hasten our death or if we encourage somebody else to hasten their death. Well, thank you uh, so much for that. I know that we are leaving a number of really good questions on the floor. And in a moment, I'm going to tell you where you can perhaps um, raise those questions again, if not directly with Dr. Cottle herself. Um, I'm going to just uh, give you also some uh, suggested resources if you want to take this a little further. And I'll give you, Dr. Cottle, just uh, any last opportunity to um, share some of 
uh, additional ones if you have any. Uh, as was already mentioned, you already heard her uh, quoting some different authors and things during her presentation, and I saw a number of you writing those down. That's great. Uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, we have some hard copies of a few articles that she has co-written with others. Uh, we printed a few more off on the table by the windows there. Um, but if you're watching online or if you're watching here in person, uh, all of you should know that our denomination has also assembled a number of resources. So if you go to the website cbwc.ca, cbwc.ca, and then if you would click on the resources tab, you will find an option there for MADE. And if you go to that, that particular page, there are a number of resources that are there. I know Dr. Cuddles had a chance to look those over as well, but I thought maybe I'll ask you just uh, last chance to, uh, to put in any plugs for any additional resources that you would recommend for people. Um, I think a little bit of it depends on what the questions are. Um, there's a, a, a book that I, I sent a, uh, to you, Jeff, on that list called With the End in Mind. And the Dr. Catherine Mannix, M-A-N-N-I-X, is a British retired palliative care physician. And she tells stories about uh, people who are, are dying. It's a, it's a secular book but there's a, a spirituality kind of to it that is, is um, not unfavorable. Um, and uh, if you are thinking about like, what is, it, what is it like to die? She's very good about explaining that and talking about things. And, you know, coming along, I guess the biggest thing is not to run away from this. Um, coming alongside each other when things are tough is one of the most deeply human things we can do. And it's like gold refined by fire, that if we're in the cauldron alongside someone else, or we allow others to come with us, um, you know, independence is not a Christian virtue, interdependence is. And we have every bit as much a responsibility to allow others to care for us when we need it, as we do to care for others when they need it. And, you know, I'm talking to myself here too. We, we, this is not our cultural norm. It's certainly not our Western cultural norm, but we need to care for one another. And when we do that, God gives back to us, pressed down and overflowing this gold refined by fire. Autonomy and saying, oh, you wanna be dead? We'll make that happen. To me, that's like those little gold plastic trinkets in the Cracker Jack box versus the gold refined by fire that the Lord offers to us in the midst of this. And um, I, I, I'd like to just um, end with a quotation. It's the last stanza of a poem by Longfellow, and it's this big, long poem called Moratory Salutamus, which was, we who are about to die salute you, which is what the gladiators used to say. But it, it was a poem he wrote about people who did things at the end of their life when they were older. <clears throat> and the last stanza talks about um, the skies getting darker. And I think that it's not only when we get older, but as our culture gets darker, think about this. He says, for age is opportunity no less than youth itself, though in another dress. For as the evening twilight fades away, the sky is filled with stars, invisible by day. So as the twilight of our culture is fading more into darkness, we get to be those stars that shine in the universe that Paul talked about in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And, you know, these people are not our enemies. These people that want this, they're not our enemies. They are deluded by the evil one. And we have the words of life. We know what can bring shalom to them. And I just pray for you, and I will in a moment here, that, that the Lord will give you those moments to bring that light. Let me just take a moment and pray for you as we finish here. Father God, I thank you for everyone who has uh, given up a Saturday morning or whatever time they're listening to this 
I thank you for their attention. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that just as you did on the day of Pentecost, that you would take the words that have been spoken and interpret them into each person's language, into their own life, as to and and encourage them and empower them to do the things that you are calling them to do. I pray that you would make them people uh, from Romans 15, people who are people of hope, who overflow with hope into this world of ours, where hope is in short supply, and that they would shine in the darkness, that your light, that you are the light of the world, and you care for each one of us made in, the, in, the, in your image. And I, I pray that they would um, hear your voice behind them saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, whether they turn to the right or to the left, and would know that little is much when you are in it. And I thank you in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much. I want to just uh, offer a few uh, final details and thanks uh, for those of you especially who are in attendance here today, uh, but also for others. Uh, there is a, a number of little cards on your tables here uh, advertising a very appropriate follow-up to this particular workshop. This is a series that we've called Death Warmed Over. It's, uh, it's all a conversation about the whole end-of-life process, and uh, it's going to be starting up this next Sunday. And so if you have questions that you asked that were not answered, um, bring them with you, not tomorrow, but the, the following Sunday, March the 3rd. Our very first class uh, session will be a follow-up to this particular workshop and a discussion facilitated by someone all about it. And then as you can see, if you look on the back side of the card, we have different dates with a whole bunch of other kinds of um, uh, options that are there. We'll feed you lunch and stuff. What would be best is if you signed up, if you, as best as you can, sign up for as many of the classes as you're able to come to. That gives us a bit of an accurate number for, uh, for preparing the food uh, about that. But many thanks to Bonnie and our pastoral care team for your work in assembling that course. Let's take a moment to thank our volunteers from the kitchen who have kept us well fed. <laughs> Let's also very much thank our tech volunteers who made this all happen technically. <laughs> and lastly, and, and uh, I think most appropriate, let's uh, thank Dr. Cottle for sharing her life, a time of wisdom and experience with us today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, let's, let's wave goodbye to her now. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Okay, have a good rest of the day. We'll Go rescue my later. puppy. Okay. okay. All right, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Bye-bye. Okay,